Paul introduces himself to the church in Rome in chapter 1. We, this is a theological letter. It's not just a letter telling about, you know, how things are going and how are things with you, but it's a theological treatise. He wants the Christians that live in Rome to be able to understand their faith and to understand the power of the gospel of God. And we looked over the last couple of weeks um, at that. Um, the last two verses we looked at two weeks ago is kind of the, the, the crux of the whole book. Um, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For in it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith for faith, for it's written, the righteous shall live by faith. So his whole, now he's going to unpack that. What does it mean for the righteous to live by faith? What does it mean that salvation is given to everyone who believes? And he's going to spend the next, what we call, 16 chapters of a book. He didn't write it in chapters and verses. That came in later. But he writes this whole treatise to help us unpack that salvation and what it means to not be ashamed of the gospel, but to live by faith. So that's where we're going here. Um, if you saw the little promo I put on Facebook, standing in front of the emergency room, you know, we hate going through those doors because those doors mean something's wrong, right? But if we don't go through those doors, we're not going to get to the help that's on the other side. And that's what this chapter is. This is, this is the doors of the ER, okay? And if, you, if, if, we, if we just heard today's sermon and nothing else that follows it, then we're hopeless, okay? But hang on, and that's why we want to continue on in the weeks to come to be able to learn more about this great gospel and this great gospel. But we can't know about it until we can at least go through that, that hard part, and that's what we're doing today. So you guys got the courage to stick with me through it? Yes, we're courageous. We're going to do this. Okay, those of you online, okay, online at home, we're all going to we're going to plug right through this here. Paul is not going to sugarcoat the message at all. Okay, so we're not going to sugarcoat it either. So we'll work through this passage verse by verse. It begins, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And the word wrath here, there's two words that he, that he could have used here in the Greek language. This is not the, this is not the, the hot-headed, out-of-control, angry temper sort of wrath. This is that, that quiet, just kind of, it's just kind of eating you up on the inside sort of wrath, okay? It's kind of that giving the kid the look. You don't have to lose your temper over it. You give them the look and they know that they've crossed the line, right? So that's kind of like the wrath of God. It's kind of just, it's just boiling up inside of him and he's not losing control, but he's given us that look. But why would God be mad at the world? But this passage is going to remind us that he has reasons to be angry with us. He has, angry, he has reasons to be angry with me. He has ang- reasons to be angry with each of you and everybody else. So that's what we're going to look at today. Why would God be mad at me? Well, this passage is going to tell us that we were made for God's glory. That's why we were born. That's why we were created, to give God glory. We were born to be made in his image. And unfortunately, these two things, ungodliness and unrighteousness, keep us from giving God glory and to be able to reflect his image that he created us with. Now, God created awesome people in this awesome world. But then all these awesome people like you and me, we messed it up. God's glory and God's image was stamped into mankind, but it was ruined. This may sound really dumb to a lot of people, but one of my prized possessions of living in Russia was the ceramic wall bust of Vladimir Lenin, the first leader of the Soviet Union. Um, Some friends of mine found this in a dumpster when we first went to Russia and it was the Soviet Union collapsed. Somebody just threw this big thing away. I mean, it was big around like this. And somebody got it, and I was like, that is such a cool souvenir, you know. And then they left to come to the States, and they said, I'm giving this away. And I'm like, I'll take it. So I held on to it for all those years and brought it back to America with me. And, of course, I brought it back to America, and it just sat, you know, in an empty closet or in a closet someplace. Um, And then it came time to move from Pennsylvania out here, and so it was packed in the moving truck. When I got here and unpacked it, somehow the shaking around had broken it into a million pieces. I was so upset because my Vladimir Lenin statue was gone. Um, It was just a a reminder to me that, you know, for 70 years, you know, this, this first leader had started something that was ruining people's lives. 
And we were there in the 90s to try to bring back hope again. And so it was a reminder of that. So it meant something to me. Um, but you know what? You know, it, it's, it, it's okay. It's okay that it, that it died, that it got thrown in the trash. I don't miss it too much. Um, I have another prized possession from my time in Russia. If you want to pull that up there. Um, the last summer we were there, our summer went to the Baltic Sea. And as we were walking around the little town that was there, there was this really cute little, little church, this little Orthodox church that had been built on the site of what had been um, about 30, 30, 30 years before um, a, little, a little nursery school, a nursery school that, uh, that a small plane had crashed right into. And all the kids and the people that worked there and the people on the plane all perished there. And in that spot, they built this little, this little prayer chapel. And it was such a beautiful little place with the willow trees around it. And I was just like, this is so beautiful. I wish I could just like come here sometimes and just sit here and pray and just enjoy the scenery of it. Well, a month later, it was my birthday. And for my birthday present, it turned out that my wife, uh, with a friend of hers who had some skills and talent, helped her, helped Alina paint this picture of this place for me. And it was like the best present I'd ever gotten. It was like, this is so amazing because now I can see this place that was so special in my mind. It was so beautiful. You know, it, 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 and, and this, this hangs on our living room wall, okay? I never put linen up on the wall. It sat in the closet, okay? But this is something special to me. Why is this so special to me? Because it brings back a warm memory. And it was given to me and made for me by somebody that loves me. Somebody who wanted to do something very special, and it's meaningful to me. And so it hangs in a prominent place in our living room wall. And of course, you know, it's not only the fact that that's a beautiful place. It's, it's, it's basically the creator that made it for me that makes it really special as well. You know, when, when people, when people um, you, know, when, you know, when people look at you and me, you know, we want them to be able to say, wow, there's a wonderful creator that made each of us. That's what God made us for. You know, he's the, and we are like his painting that he put together. We're created in his image, we're made for his glory. And we can't just blame it on Adam and Eve that everything got ruined or don't even blame it on the devil because he didn't really make us do it. And the future chapters, Adam and Eve is going to be dealt with here. Paul's gonna talk about the fiasco and how they brought sin into our lives and how we're all born with that original sin. But the problem is each of us has our own dose of ungodliness and unrighteousness that suppresses the truth. The truth is like, I mean, suppressing the truth is like when you fill up a suitcase and it's so packed full, you sit on the top to try to latch it down. You know, you're trying to get everything in there, but something's creeping out the sides and keeping it from closing well. And then when you finally get it closed and it pops back open again, I mean, suppressing the truth is something that we want to do because the truth is we don't like it that the truth makes us look so bad. We don't want to see the ungodliness and the righteous unrighteousness in our lives. And so we try to suppress that truth and make it so it's not so bad after all. But the truth is all around us. And there's a truth that points to the glory of God that we humans have messed up. The next verse says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. If we think about it, the creation that God made, the immensity, the order, the beauty of it, you know, whether it's a beautiful sunrise or sunset, whether it's a mountain, whether it's an ocean, whether it's the fluffy white snow, which it looks like it's starting to come down out there. So be careful leaving today. It might get a little bit slippery out there. Um, the zigzag of lightning, a rainbow, the dew on a spider's web, a litter of puppies, a galloping horse or schools of fish swimming among the coral, you name it. Creation is shouting out God's glory, right? But none of that is made in God's image. But humans, we are made in God's image. And we give the artist of all this glory lots of praise and thanksgiving for all he's made. But we are made in his image. We are different than all the other things God's created. And what do we do? We ooh and awe at all the things that God made, but then we look at each other and we look at ourselves and what do we do? Yeah, <laughs> you know, we have a lot of disgust for our thing that's been made in the image of God. And because we see how messed up we are, we have to suppress the truth 
Yes, we know that we're broken. We know that we need God to restore us and to recreate us in his image and to get that glory back inside of us again. But that's what the good news of the gospel is all about. It's not, it's let's stop feeling bad about the human race, but have hope that God has something good planned for us, that he wants to reveal his image in us, even though it's been ruined by sin. And so because we don't really want to see that, we don't want to look at that mess, what we do is we ignore the truth and we steal God's glory and we place it on ourselves anyway. We'd rather think of ourselves as the master of our own universe. We like to think that mankind is better than it actually is. We like to think that we're all really okay deep down inside because we compare ourselves with one another. And we forget about the glory of God that is not seen through us and that the image of God is, has been squashed inside of us. And if you think I'm talking about all the other people out there, this is something that applies to each and every one of us. We're all in the same boat because without God's grace, this description in Romans 1 is exactly where all of us is at. So don't listen to this and think it applies to somebody else. It's something for all of us. It's the core of who we are. The next verse goes on to say, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. You know, when a person looks at creation, they acknowledge the fact that there's got to be a, a, a designer behind it. There's got to be an artist behind it. There's got to be some, some sort of intelligence that makes all of this work so well. But if God created all this... Then that means that God created me and that there's a purpose for everything. And if there's a purpose for the rainbow and a purpose for the snow, there's a purpose for our lives as well. And a lot of people don't want to know what God's purpose is for them because that goes against their own purposes for themselves, right? So it's easier just to say, oh, it's all happened by accident. Oh, it's all just a random, you know, evolutionary thing that came about through some spark that came out of nowhere. So if we want to go back to the beginning, we could look at creation. And we can see that there's got to be something more out there. And there's stories told about people of places around the world that don't have a Bible, that don't have a church. They don't know about Jesus. But there are some people in the world, they look at all the creation and they start worshiping the creation. That's why a lot of societies, they worship all of the things that are made. But some people start to go, I think there's something behind that. And they start to worship a God that they don't even know his name. And they begin to open up their hearts to a God, the creator of the universe, instead of worshiping the creation itself. And our hope is that as we spread the news about Jesus throughout the world, that these people will find out who they're really worshiping. That he has a name. That God has a name. And his name is Jesus. And we, that's why we want to spread the word out there so that people will know we don't want to worship the creation, but worship the creator behind it. When people ignore the truth and they make up their new version of truth, then that becomes their way of life. No wonder a person ends up exchanging the glory of God for the glory of images. Instead of glorifying the creator, people glorify the created thing, which might be something in nature or it might be just themselves, because that's a very easy thing to worship, right? You know, it's hard to see a beautiful sunrise and not give the glory somewhere. You know, it's like, You've, you either acknowledge that it's a God who made it, or you just say, how lucky I am that I got up to see this today, right? I mean, there's two different ways of looking at that sunrise. One gives God the glory, one doesn't. You know, that picture of that little church that Alina made. You know, do you think I hide the fact that she painted it? If somebody comes in our house and I go, oh, that's a really pretty picture, what do you think the next thing I'm going to say is? You know who made it? <laughs> my wife painted it for me, and she gave it to me for my birthday, Okay. Because why? I want to give glory to the creator. It's not just about the picture, but it's about the creator of the picture. And that's what we do with God. We give glory to the creator of the pictures, the images around us. But what is the common thing for mankind to do is to rob God of that glory. They, they find an excuse not to be thankful to him or not to, be glory, not to give him the glory for what he's done. You know, when we as Christians, when we see God in nature, it makes us want to be good stewards of that nature. We want to take care of the things that God made. We want to be able to have good, practice good um, ecology because God told us to take care of the earth. 
We need to use it as it's needed to, but we need to take as good of care of it as we can. So without God, what drives that movement of taking care of the earth is just worshiping the planet, worshiping the things that are made. So don't cut down that tree. Don't, don't take away the habitat of those animals that are there. And that's all good and, good and, good and fine, but where, what's the motivation? Is it because we value the things that the creator behind it, or we worship those actual things? And that's what people in our world have done. They've exchanged the glory of God, and they're worshiping the image, the things that he created. All right, not only have they done that, but they've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. The next verse go on to say, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Amen means what? We hopefully learned this through our fiasco in our government a month ago. Amen means so be it, Lord. So be it, Lord. This is a statement that's basically Paul saying, God, let this be. Let this be the truth that people will learn to worship the creator and not the created thing. But the lie that we tend to believe as humans is that we ourselves are worthy of being worshipped, and we serve ourselves instead of God. Eve exchanged that truth of God for a lie. Then Adam believed the lie, and every human since then has fallen prey to the lie. The crux of the lie is that God's just pulling something over, on our, over our eyes, you know? God really, did he really mean to say that? Did he really mean that? Is he trying to keep something from us? That's what Satan uses to try to get us to doubt God's words, to doubt God's word itself. Um, not only do we take away the glory that's deserved for God and we give it to the creation, but we take away the worship that's deserved for God and we worship the created thing. And when we take God's truth and we throw it in the trash, then we begin worshiping our own idea of what needs to be worshiped. And as a result, things like pride and greed and lust enter into our hearts, things that were never meant to be there in the first place. And when people... Um, start worshiping people, okay, then what are they going to do? They're going to start saying, hey, look at the most beautiful. Look at the most, the strongest. Look at the very best. Because they began to capture our eye the most. And then they capture not only our eyes, but our hearts and our bodies follow through. When we worship beauty and sex appeal, when we dive into every whim and appetite of lust, People using each other, degrading what God meant to be a loving thing, and people turning it into a carnival of horrors. And the lie is the freedom that says, I could do what I want, with whom I want. Um, and it covers up the truth that unbridled lust only hurts ourselves and others. And it hurts God as well. Because God created a natural order to relationships. And sin enters the picture and messes it all up when we get involved in this, this uh, sexual destructive web that's there when we're worshiping the created thing, the people, instead of God. And the whole point of this passage is to illustrate the spiritual breakdown of the created order. And he uses the example of the breakdown in created order by talking about sexuality. Going on, it says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. We're not going to totally chase down that rabbit trail today, and there's a lot to say about that. Um, unfortunately, some people use these verses to beat up people who have same-sex attractions. That's not the point of what Paul is trying to say here. He's using this as an example, an illustration. He's not trying to pick on homosexuality. It's not at the top of the list of terrible sins like some people make it out to be because the whole point of this passage is all of these things are not at the top of the list, okay? What's really at the top of the list is the fact that we did what? That we, that we robbed God of his glory, that we suppressed the truth, that we robbed God of his image, and as we're going to see, that we worship the wrong thing. That's what it all comes down to. Because we do those things, then all these other sins come out, okay? So the, it's not about necessarily what we do or don't do, but it's about those core things. We'll get into that here in a second. There is a spiritual breakdown in God's created order. 
Just like we see a sexual breakdown in God's created order as well. You know, God's original created order was that being made in the image of God, male and female, do that perfectly. It's not that even though God is male, we use the male sort of things, but male and female equally and together reflect God in a way that nothing else does. Nothing else in God's creation reflect God as much as especially the union between a man and a woman, how that comes together. That, that displays God's glory more than anything. And so Genesis 1 and 2 talks about that, how that he created this thing to be able to give God the glory. And throughout the Bible, God uses marriage and that relationship between a man and a woman to describe him and his relationship with us in so many different ways. You know, the male and female, their bodies fit together and they're able to reproduce. They can complement each other in ways that two men or two women can't do. And in the unity of an, of an opposite-sex couple, you can find diversity and unity in the midst of that. Therefore, we take seriously the idea of a marriage between male and female to be a sacred relationship of God. You know, a couple of the same sex, they could love each other. They could have a healthy relationship. They could find happiness. But what they miss is that they are not reflecting the image of God in the perfect way. They are missing out on that. And that's why God says you're missing the mark. That's what's wrong with the same-sex marriage thing. It's missing the mark and not showing the reflection of God in the way that he created it to be. We're broken. We live in a broken world. And a lot of people may have the leanings towards one way or another, and they feel like they can't help it. We need to have compassion. We need to understand that we're all in a broken world. And nobody's picking on anybody here, but just the fact that we're all in the same boat. We're all broken. And that's just an example of the brokenness, of the sin that enters our lives, that leads us into different directions. Sin is anything that keeps us from loving people and loving God. And that's part of the, the argument. People are like, well, they're, they're loving each other. What's wrong with that? God wants us to love each other. But he also wants us to love God. And part of loving God is being able to love and have the sexual relationship that God said, this is what reflects me the best. Not because God is into his ego, but that's what he created us for. That's the image that he wants to be able to portray here on the earth. So um, Paul tells us, just like you know, homosexuality, any sin, it's robbing God of the glory that he intended for mankind. And sin and every sin has robbed God of his glory in us. And that's the bigger problem here. Because God created us for godliness, for righteousness in every single person, whether you're gay or straight. You say, if we say no to the design that God gave to us, then we're recreating ourselves in the image that we want to see. And we become gods of our own lives, worshiping the created thing rather than the creator. And so Paul ends up by saying, this is, this is where it leads us, okay? And since they did not see, see fit to acknowledge God, they, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. What a list there. The church in Rome, when they saw this list, they said, man, Paul, you know where we live. <laughs> That's what's all around us here in Rome. I mean, Rome had a great reputation. Paul had never been there before, but he knew what Rome was like. And this whole list, it covered it pretty well. <coughs> Rome was a city awash in all of these things. And the world continues on the road that leads to Rome. It leads us away from the truth of God. It leads us away from the glory of God. It takes us away from the image of God, and it takes us away from the worship of God. And so when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter what sin we have that displays itself in our life. The core sin are these four things, according to this passage here, of not giving God thanks, of ignoring the truth, of stealing his glory, and worshiping things that God has made. These are the original sins that lead us down the path. God says, once you've done this, he just turns us loose and anything else can happen. But these are the things we need to focus on. These are the things that separate us from God. That we're not giving him that glory. We're not worshiping him. We're taking away the truth and not giving him thanks. That's where it is. We are stealers. We are thieves taking away um, God's truth. 
and uh, his glory and his worship. You know, it's not just the evil dictators, the serial killers, the abortion doctors, and the pedophiles that God's mad at. He's mad at all of us because we've all been guilty of these things that are there. As theologian John, called, uh, 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 John Calvin called it, he said that our hearts have become a factory of idols. We choose our own idols, don't we? And we put them before God. Or we put God in the midst of them and say, God, I'll worship you, but I'll keep worshiping these idols as well, right alongside. And that's what we're guilty of. We have the DNA of ungodliness and righteousness in our spirits. And there are sins that start in our heart. They move to our mind. Our thinking becomes depraved. And um, all of these things they, that we do, they rob us of the true truth and the glory and reflecting his image and giving him the worship that he's due. So we're all thieves when it comes to God. That's what we've done. Uh, we've stolen these things from him. And though they know God's righteous decree, those that practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Even if you're not doing them, but you approve of it, we're all in the same boat. We're all guilty. Last week, Rob did double duty and gave you two homework assignments. I'm just giving you back one this week, okay? He's a stricter teacher than I am. Think of this list that's there. Just take a minute here. Look at the list. You know, do, do an honest heart search. Really be honest. Even if you're walking the Christian life, are there still ways that you feel like you're still stealing from God? Are there ways we're still, still falling into the traps of these four things and stealing these things from him? Just kind of think it through there. Because... Even if we've been saved, we've been forgiven, we still, we still fall temptation to keep doing these things because it's part of our DNA. Take a think, think about that for a second here. And, you know, Jesus tells everybody, come as you are, but he never says stay as you are. Come as you are, but he's willing to come and he's going to transform our minds and transform our hearts and work on us. It may take weeks and months and years for that transformation to really produce the fruit but he's working on those things. And so if there's people you feel like, man, they've gone too far. They people you love that have crossed the line. No, there's hope. There is hope that God will turn them back around again and get them on the right path. Again, like I said, today's sermon is like going through the doors of the ER. Okay. And I promise you next week, it gets way better. We get to see how the savior comes alongside and meets us in our deepest need of chapter two. We see that the wrath of God is going to turn into the kindness of God. Okay, so stick with me through next week. Um, we had to enter these doors and get through chapter 1 as it diagnoses us. But imagine, what if verses 24 to 32 that we read, what if they were written, rewritten in a positive alternative rendering? What if because we totally surrendered our wills over to the Lord and we didn't rob him of anything, what would it look like? I think it would read like this. Listen up, see if it sounds familiar, but in the opposite. It says, therefore, God gave them up in their hearts to self-control and purity, that their bodies might be honored among them. For they kept and cherished the truth of God, and they worshiped and served the creator who is blessed forever rather than the creature. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to pure and wholesome lives lived with carefree ease, even in the most intimate relationships, so that all received in their own persons the due reward of their fidelity. And just, as, and just as they saw fit to acknowledge God in all things, God gave them up to a sound mind, to do the things which are proper, being filled with all righteousness, goodness, generosity, kindness, full of selflessness, life, healing, openness, kindliness, they are gentle in speech, always building others up, lovers of God, respectful, humble, self-effacing, inventors of good, obedient to parents, understanding, trustworthy, loving, merciful. And as they knew the ordinances of God and those who practice these things are possessors of life, they all do the same and they give hearty approval to those who do likewise. Isn't that a great rendering? Let that be the description of us because we've been transformed by God's kindness that we'll look at next week. Part of God's kindness is the fact that he came to earth for us 
and he took that sacrifice. He said, you guys are so depraved, and my wrath is against you, but Jesus says, I am going to come. I'm going to take on a body, and I'm going to accept the punishment of the wrath that these people all deserve, that all of us deserve. And so that's why we stop and we remember what Jesus has done for us, because without him and his kindness, there would be no hope for us. We would be under his wrath eternally. So as we take the bread, we're reminded that Jesus left heaven to be able to come to earth, to be able to give us what is needed. So we take the bread in remembrance of him.